who's going to chair the first session. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come down to uh, NISO today to host this event to mark the publication of the special issue uh, in the National Street Economic Review on Smith and uh, uh, the Tercentenary. Um, I'm going to rely on part of the team at the University of Glasgow that supported the work around the Tercentenary. I'll be chairing this session uh, event today along with my colleague Santa and Goshal, who will look after the second um, panel. As Stephen said, last year marked the Tercentenary of the birth of Adam Smith. And what we're keen to do at Glasgow as his academic home is to run a series of events and activities to mark that um, commemoration, to, to engage with his ideas, to challenge his ideas, to reflect on the relevance um, for today. And we took Smith to over 20 countries um, with drawing on experts from around the world to debate and discuss Smith. We also took Smith to new audiences, so from high school kids through to students at university. <laughs> and we're really keen that, that the work had academic rigor and that's why we're so delighted to be able to have a special issue edition in the National Institute of Economic Review and reflecting on Smith's work. We had the the um, issue is available around the room. There's ten fantastic articles in all different aspects of Smith's work from trade, from innovation, productivity, macroeconomics, right the way through to how Smith has been used and misused in uh, big economic debates. And as Stephen said, the second panel will probably talk, talk in one of Smith's famous pieces of work around trade. But what we're going to do in this first session was to think about why is an 18th century moral philosopher still relevant to the big economic policy debates that we have today? And we've got a fantastic panel here to give some of their reflections on that. People have been involved in the special issue, but also been writing um, more generally around Smith over the last, uh, over the last year. So we'll hear from Sir Anton Muscatelli, Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Glasgow, but for today, uh, enjoying himself in his uh, traditional discipline as a professor of economics. Um, and Anton will talk about, about Smith and human capital. And we'll also hear from Professor Kat Lear, one of the co-investigators on the major grant award that we had for the Templeton Foundation and someone who led the work at the university around reflecting Smith to modern debates and taking Smith to audiences, thinking about how Smith and his thinking influences modern organisations, unsurprisingly our role as Professor of Organisational Studies at the University of Glasgow. Before Kat, we'll hear from Professor Emeritus Marcus Miller from the University of Warwick, a distinguished academic, but also somebody who's been heavily involved in policy debates over the year, both as an economist at the Bank of England, but also advisor to the Treasury Committee of the House of Commons. And Mark has written a great article in the special issue about innovation, the benefits of specialisation and, and competition, and how that can spur growth, but also lead to growing inequalities. But to kick us off, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Ronnie MacDonald from the University of Glasgow. Ronnie, as many of you will know, is a globally renowned macroeconomist, having literally writ written the book on exchange <laughs> rates and international finance, written many books on exchange rates and international finance over the years. And he's, he's written a fantastic article on a special issue around how Smith has been interpreted in aspects of the economic literature. And I'll let Ronnie set out his, his, what he thinks of that. Each speaker will speak for around about five minutes and then we'll open up to a conversation. And I'm really keen to get some comments from people in the room. So, Ronnie, can I invite you to go first, please? Yeah, thanks very much, Graham. So, I'm about to try and condense a, a 40 page article or so to five minutes. So, just, <laughs> just bear with me. I'm going to read this so that I, I don't stray too far. So, um, neoliberal policies have resulted in a sharp rise in equality, the exacerbation of market failures the rise in crony capitalism, and crucially, a breakdown in societal trust. The focus of my paper is first to demonstrate that neoliberal policies and the societal ills they have created are not consistent with Smith's thinking, contrary to what many believe. And indeed, social trust is central to his view of socioeconomic process, process, progress. Rather. Given this, how can a re-reading of Smith's work help to provide policy responses to address the failings of neoliberal policies in 2024. So to answer this, we first need to understand that neoliberal policies are based on an economic model, which I believe is very different to that proposed by Smith. Specifically, Smith approached economic and other issues as a moral philosopher, and I think it's crucially important to remember that. His moral philosophy was based on the strand of uh, philosophy 
refer to as virtue ethics, and I'm happy to say more about that in discussions. Now, although the, the Wealth of Nations highlights the role of one particular virtue ethics, which is um, prudence, and usually refer to as self-interest in discussion of Smith, one of his five virtue ethics, in how individuals behave in their market transactions, it's crucially important to note that other virtues interplay with this. And Smith is clear that it is wrong to specialize a theory of ethics down to one of the moral virtues, as in other moral philosophies, and as has been the case in modern economics. Therefore, therefore to understand Smith's thinking on economic and other issues, it's important to take a holistic approach to his work in terms of reading the wealth of nations in conjunction with his theory of moral sentiment, with its focus on temperance or self-control and sympathy for others, and indeed his lectures on jurisprudence where the virtue of ethic of justice dominates. Central to Smith's view of morality is that values and norms are formed through our interactions with others in society, and critical to this is that we have sympathy for others. Markets, which are of course central to the wealth of nations, are embedded in society in its formal and informal institutions, including its norms and values. They're not some mathematical abstraction as has become the case. Unfortunately for virtue ethics as a more, unfortunately virtue ethics as a moral philosophy died with Smith and other classical economists such as David Ricardo and John Stuart Mill confirmed this in their work, moving political economy towards economic man and a focus on self-interest with a direction of travel that ultimately produced the neoclassical model, which I believe underpins the uh, new liberal paradigm, as I call it in the paper. So just very briefly, what are the consequences of abandoning Smith's view of ethics? Well, first of all, in Smith's development of virtue ethics, individual actions are shaped through formal and informal constraints into collective action by accepted values and norms. And this process crucially pr uh, produces civic and so social, sorry, societal trust, a central element of what has become known as social capital. Now, trust is ex essential to Smith because it, um, in Smith, of course, the extent of the market is crucial for the productivity of the division of labor, for example, and trust is essential for the extent of the market. It's also crucial, as he points out, for capital accumulation, which is also a crucial part of his model, but also more generally for social stability. To do it today, many indicators uh, of social capital and trust indicate that in neoliberal societies, we've seen a huge depreciation, depreciation of so, social capital and trust is basically broken. Uh, David Putnam started that off with his Bowling Alone book, as some of you will, will know. And according, accordingly, social capital has been, been depleted. Now, consistent with Smith's emphasis on trust, uh, I think it's worth noting that Francis Fukuyama, Fukuyama rather, in his, um, his, his book on trust, which looks at the development of liberal democracies in the post-war era, comes to the following startling conclusion, which I think would chime strongly with Smith. And it is that a nation's well-being, as well as its ability to compete, is conditioned by a single pervasive cultural characteristic, namely the level of trust inherent in that society. So I think one clear important policy implication coming out of my paper is that rebuilding social capital and trust is critical uh, going forward if we're to avoid some of the uh, unpleasant consequences of neoliberal policies. The second implication of, of, of my paper is that central to the wealth of nations is, as I said, the market, but the market economy today is driven almost solely by incentives of gains and losses. And as a result of uh, the neoliberal paradigm, the market economy of Smith has morphed into the so-called market, market society, where the market shapes the personal attitudes, lifestyles, and political views of individual, and nearly everything today is now commodified. The market today has become disconnected from the fundamental norms and values of society, which underscored Smith's approach. You've got a kind of reverse causality uh, of the market now in, in today's society. This would seem to me to be the ultimate market failure from a Smithian perspective, since he placed a clear limit, moral limits on the market. So there's a, a policy response there, I believe, in re rebasing these values and norms.
Smith also highlights a further important market failure, which is, is also mentioned by uh, Marcus Miller and um, um, one of the, one of the other sorry one of the other papers in one of the other authors in 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 the in the journal, namely the principal agent problem. This is due to the divorce of ownership and control in Smith's day of the joint stock company, which is the forerunner of the modern corporation. Smith indeed went as far as to argue that this divorce of ownership and control could undermine the British economy if it was not addressed. And it hasn't been addressed because in, under neoliberal policies, the, 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 um, this important market failure has been exacerbated by Milton Friedman's dictum that the sole objective of the modern corporation is to maximize profits at the expense of other crucial objectives of the firm such as the replacement of capital inputs used by the firm, including social and natural capital, and its role with respect to other crucial stakeholders. Many see this as the biggest policy question that we face today. For example, Professor Colin Mayer has argued in relation to Friedman's dictum that few social science theories are so significant and misconstrued as to threaten our existence. Both Mayer and Mark Carney, indeed, and many others argue that this issue can only be addressed by policies that align the corporation's fiduciary duty to shareholders with its public obligations to its customers and the community in which it operates. And this in turn would mean that ECG factors must be fully integrated into the governance strategy and operations of corporation, if the corporation if we are to avoid the disastrous consequences of climate change. So another significant uh, policy implication, I believe, which follows on from Smith's critique. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ronnie. It's a, a great start and covered so much ground there. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these points uh, in, the, in the broader discussion, but already getting to Smith as the social scientist, as a moral philosopher and the link to economics. So Mark, maybe I can come to you to get some reflection from your paper and you're thinking more broadly than Smith. <clears throat> I don't know if it's widely known, but Milton Friedman is only five feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, he was one of the outstanding figures, one of the giants, you might say, leading the transition from the Keynesian era after World War II into the uh, neoliberal era of which we've just heard. With Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher as charismatic cheerleaders. Um, and Adam Smith was one of uh, Friedman's heroes. Indeed, uh, Friedman saw Smith's wealth of nations together with the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson, both published in 1776 as the very foundation stones of the political economy of the United States of America. Friedman himself, of course, pursued a laissez-faire agenda, famously including the 1970 doctrine, of which we've heard from uh, just now, that the social responsibility of business is essentially to increase profits. There's only one stakeholder, is the shareholder, to summarize. This perspective, championed by the Chicago School of Lawyers, led to a weakening of antitrust rulings in the United States and to significant growth in concentration in manufacturing, in banking, and in online services. As Ronald McDonald has emphasized, however, the anti-governmental free market fundamentalism that Friedman endorsed neglected key elements of Smith's ideas in the wealth of nations. For example, uh, as is well known, to support the efficiency or the efficacy of the invisible hand, um, Smith was, was highly critical of monopolistic behavior, whether in production or in trade or in banking. And this would call for a strong line in antitrust legislation. But unfortunately, society can create institutions for this purpose. And this goes to what Ronald just been saying. That you have to embed some of these ideas in the structure of society. Here in the UK, for example, the, the CMA, 
Competition and Markets Authority is charged with protecting UK citizens from unfair trading practices, encompassing entire markets if necessary. And of course, there's a separate agency, the FCA, looking at financial services. Well, this is okay in principle. How efficient is it in practice? I'm sure we hear more about that as the afternoon goes on. <clears throat> Kenneth Arrow, not a Chicago, was quick to respond to the Cleveland Doctrine <laughs> in academic terms. Even if competitive behavior is preserved, he argued, he reminded us that markets can fail for other reasons. The asymmetry of information is one of them. If knowledge is power, then asymmetry of knowledge can lead to asymmetries of power in society. Unless action is taken to force the disclosure and maintain standards. Here in the UK, it's the task of the Competition and Markets Authority to protect people from unfair trading practices. Another key source of market failure that Arrow emphasized is the presence of externalities, which individual actors have <coughs> to ignore. In Smith's time, for example, a key externality was the impact of rapid industrialization on the local environment and on the health and safety of people working in the factories and the mines. In the Midlands, which is where I've come from today, uh, the Midlands were characterized as the black country, and this was for very good reason. Until the Factory Act was passed, individual factory owners faced a type of, of prison dilemma where the individual efforts to improve the health and welfare of the of your employees did very little to raise the health and welfare of the whole group of, of labor. What that requires is coordinated action. Tackling such externalities, uh, if we come closer to our own time, has led to the passing of the health and safety of workers. Uh, here in the UK in 1974, along with lots of regulations to make it work. That's designed to check some of these externalities. Turning to what Diane Coyle had to say in the volume, she's unfortunately unable to be with us here today, but she posed the question with geopolitical ramifications. Are we not, she asked, um, facing what she calls Smith's dilemma, a dilemma that arises with the scale of efficient production approximates to the size of the market, so only one or two producers can operate, in which case the market will cease to be competitive as a result. Two cases she cites, one are the highly specialized production networks like those for computer chips, where 90% come from Taiwan, and the other is our digital platforms, which internalize the gains of specialization as AI does. What this calls for is active antitrust policies, and she reckons that tech companies are on the whole resigned to being subject to new regulation and antitrust rules. But could these be stymied by geopolitical factors working in the opposite direction? If the US and China, for example, would they not find it strategically advantageous to back monopolistic national champions in the attempt to, to outlive the other superpowers and to ignore the World Trade Organization in the process? These will surely be the subject of discussion this afternoon. But let's not forget what Steve Hawking had to say. Success in creating AI, he said, will be the greatest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last, <laughs> unless we learn how to avoid the risks. Great. Thank you, Marcus. Um, uh, yeah, that fascinating quote at the end. And one of the events that we had in the year was Gita Gopanath and IMF talking about AI and the need for global regulation. And 
and um, engagement around that. One of the things that's quite interesting is that, is speaking as economists, we, we start very much about the economy and it is into Smith's links into social science, the moral elements actually. One of the great things, that, one of the great fun parts of this year has been working with people like Kat, who started very much at the other end as social scientists in thinking about Smith from that angle and then you come at the economy and business from, from that perspective. Mm. So it'd be great to get your reflections and thoughts, Kat. Yeah, thank, thanks, Graham, and thanks, uh, TT, here for inviting me. Um, as Graham says, I come from a very social scientific background and I wasn't aware we were so close to the Adam Smith Institute, so I hope my voice didn't carry too much and cause, uh, <laughs> cause some kind of rebellion. Um, but I think, as, as Graham says, you know, I come to Smith through not the eyes of an economist, but, but as a social scientist. And I don't think this is um, antithetical to what Smith was, because I think he was, um, as we've talked about before, you know, the world's first social scientist. He wasn't an economist um, as such. He was a moral philosopher. He wrote about music. He wrote about aesthetics. He wrote about astronomy. He wrote about rhetorics. And um, so he was very much a kind of a, a plural thinker, um, a polymath that we would, uh, as we would refer to at the time. Um, but I think this is really important to remember what I wanted to, um, the point I wanted to make today was that this is really not an aside intellectual um, statement. It's actually really telling us about um, how Smith viewed the economy as inherently about social relations. So not just about progress, not just about growth, but actually about how do we ensure social cohesion as part of uh, the development and success of, of, of our society. Um, so I want to speak very briefly to this about the idea of um, something that I was asked uh, when I was in uh, the Scottish Parliament last year. And it was, um, what, what would Smith be asking us to ask people when we ask them to follow governance and policy? In other words, when we tell people or ask people that they have legislation or policy to follow, why are they doing that? Why should they do that? And on the one hand, we can go down a technocratic or technical route and say, well, they're doing it because of these mechanisms inherently make sense in terms of producing a, a prosperous economy. But Smith would also argue that at the same time and simultaneously, we have to understand the social relations that are binded into that. And if people don't believe that, if people don't trust that element is there, then it's not going to be successful economically or socially or otherwise. And there's a number of reasons why this might happen. Um, that, we, that Smith speaks to. I think the first one, and, and uh, Ronnie picked up on this, is this idea of self-interest. So self-interest has been used and it's been appropriated and associated with Smith to be um, taken for a winner-takes-all attitude, so a survival of the fittest in some way. But of course, this was tied to Smith's idea of prudence as part of, part of the virtues. So it was really a benign mechanism for thinking about this greater good. And what do we mean by this? Well, it's not about selfishness. Self-interest is about the idea that we don't forsake someone else for going our aggressive pursuit of natural liberty. Instead, it's about enabling an accumulation of wealth that allows for a policy that leads to flourishing. And this flourishing is not only about economic progress, but it's about a stable social cohesion when individuals in society can satisfy what he calls the necessities, the conveniences, and the amusements. Now, Unlike some readings of Smith, Smith himself doesn't hierarchalise those dynamics. So he doesn't say that we, we, we get the necessities of everyone and then we go for the conveniences and then we have these frivolities or these amusements at the top. What he argues for, in order for a successful economy, those three factors have to be in place. Why is that? Well, because it's relatively easy for people to satisfy their necessities in theory, although I would question whether we're able to do that now in, in 2024. However, it's with the conveniences and amusements that we're going to be able to drive, uh, drive growth and drive progress in some way. So that's the first aspect in terms of thinking about how prudence may operate in terms of ensuring that people follow our, our policy. The second part of this is, uh, Ronnie referred to this as sympathy. So what Smith calls sympathy, what we might call empathy. And Smith talks about the idea of how we are socialised into empathy in some way. So this is not something that when we become an MP and we go and visit our constituents and they tell us how awful life is, they go, oh, now I understand what the world is. It's about a broader process of sociality, of coming into the world and recognising how the world works. And what we imagine is not that we're able to know how that person feels who is experiencing inequality, for example, but we're able to imagine it. We're able to take a leap of faith and imagine how that might be. 
And this is a really important part of Smith because what Smith argues is if we can't do that, if we're not socialized into thinking this way, then we're not going to be able to understand how the economy and, and it's all its fecundity and plurality is going to work, how all of those individuals in society are operating. And I think this is probably something that, um, that Anton's going to pick up in terms of the practicalities of how we train leaders, how we train economists, where our economists come from, what backgrounds they come from, what biographies they come from, and whether we expect them to come as a finished object that can have sympathy or empathy um, or not. <laughs> And then the final part of this, this trinity in terms of what we assume that we're asking people to do is to believe that there is, um, that there is integrity. Now, I've used the word integrity because often we talk about the idea of trust, the element of trust. And we often just talk, as, assume, you know, trust in terms of trust in monetary explains, uh, exchanges, trust in terms of other forms of economic exchanges. But Smith's view of um trust is not just about those kind of narrow conceptions of trust it's about an integrity and by integrity what we mean is not just that we follow what we know or what we think we know but actually we follow what we believe is going to happen in other words we make that leap of faith in terms of what one individual has done that an individual another individual is telling us to do and we believe that is going to benefit us in some way that is going to work towards social benefit progress uh, social cohesion and social stability in some way. And this is really important because it assumes this idea is, uh, of social cohesion and social progress isn't just about trust, it's about a faith that individuals have. And what we see just now in contemporary society, as Oni talked about, is this corrosion, not simply of trust, but of faith that if people do the right thing, it's not necessarily going to lead somewhere. Okay. So, what I would argue overall. Um, before handing over to Anton is that in order to think about Smith as this economist, this, uh, this economist or as a social scientist is not to assume that economic progress happens in a silo. It actually happens in terms of thinking about how people receive economic policy, how people understand economic policy, but also the faith they have in the, the individuals who are making that policy and who are encouraging them to follow it. And when we're asking people to do, you know, grind through things such as the cost of living crisis, through austerity measures, through very costly international conflicts, we're asking them to do a really massive, a really massive task in terms of not simply trusting us, but having faith in us to make the decisions that are going to encourage not just economic progress in general, but social cohesion for themselves as well. Thanks so much, Kat. And <laughs> you set up Anton perfectly around, you know, progress not being in silos. And I guess, Anton, in the context of that, human capital is absolutely fundamental to that. Smith was an educator, first and foremost, and that gets to the heart of, I think, what we were trying to do with the tertiary, but also, I guess, the progress of where the economy was heading. So, yeah, thank you very much, Graham. And uh, as you say, I want to focus on this. It's not in the, um, in the special uh, edition, but it's actually part, as you mentioned, of other contributions. I was asked last year to give a lecture to, uh, to Cordy Old Kirk, uh, for the Adam Smith Global Foundation and <laughs> human capital. And, and of course, um, I want to give you the opportunity to talk a bit about skills formation from education. Perhaps Smith might have thought about 2024 and uh, his on that. Uh, but also what you, Smith, might have had about the technology and global development. Um, now, we know from the Wealth of Nations, Smith absolutely thought of human capital as part of capital stock um, near first and as a best known quote. The acquired and useful abilities of all inhabitants of the society is required of human capital as part of the capital stock. And of course, as you, as you mentioned, Graham, he was part of the university system. He will have observed that in the 80s, actually, Scotland had greater share than uh, neighboring countries like him uh, around a uh, number of universities um, relative to the size of the population. He also would have observed that in Scotland, Universities were changing quite rapidly. There were new professorships were being established at the time uh, in law, medical schools, you know, expansion of new subjects like chemistry, like botany, as part of the development of agricultural, commerce, and industry. We absolutely understood that. Smith also understood the importance of technical and affordable basic education, uh, what we now find of private education, not only as a way of growing human capital, but actually because he understood also the reverse causality of the importance of what's said. 
the negative impact of the human, uh, on the human mind of, of the division of labor of factory conditions. And in fact, he discusses both formal and informal learning, like the learning falling out as a way of enhancing social cohesion going back to the point. It was also a critic, a sharp critic of, of, of constraints in the market for education. He was of the guilds. He helped James Walter Glasgow to uh, actually fight some of the guilds and the way in which they restricted access to skill formation. He observed that apprenticeships are part of the market process and are not the responsibility of the sovereign, but he said that they are controlled by the guilds. And yet, he insists that traditional apprenticeship structures that exist in his time. The form, noting that I they are, and I quote, the epitome of the restrictions of the principles of competition and liberty. It goes on to say that the continuance of the apprenticeship, the whole labor of the apprentice belongs to his master. Sharply. So I think in a 21st century context, the, I would have no that the limitations of access to skills formation and education would argue strongly against any system which access to these opportunities for individual citizens. But the balance that he also I think that took away the hands of sectors like the tertiary sector <laughs> towards market demand signals and doesn't ensure an efficient allocation of resources. Uh, as typical, Smith would have taken uh, counterposing views and he would certainly have looked at both sides. By the way, in terms of education delivery, uh, uh, competition also saw competition as a way of uh, improving teacher and teacher. Um, he complained about the laziness of tutors who are too secure in their jobs and makes reference to his colleagues at Balliol College, Oxford, who had, and I quote, given up altogether even the pretense of teaching. Um, <laughs> I know he doesn't make any comments of the likes about Glasgow University. Oh, he's a Glasgow. <laughs> the French. So then, but in my lecture, uh, I think Claudia also talks to the technology and how Smith might have used it. Technological improvements now, as Marcus has said, around AI are very different from what was happening in agricultural and industrial society. Um, <laughs> a sophisticated thinker who understood the impact of technological progress in early industrial society, I have no doubt he would have understood the skills biased nature of technological change in the 20th century. I think he would have adapted to see this differently, um, especially in a year when Friday Zinn uh, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, but also, I think he would have understood some of the issues around labor capital substitution, which you know, are found in place in the 19th century. And I think he would have been more Johnson and progress. I think he would have been alive to these things. Uh, and indeed, as Diane Coyle uh, and colleagues have pointed out, the fact that Smith thought, thought of capital as both produced assets and buildings, machinery, but also non produced assets, such as time and consumer capital. I think suggests to me that he would have paid a lot of attention to how both investment in fixed and in human capital were constrained to own growth. I think he would have been fascinated by the UK's and other countries' 21st century productivity problems. I think, given the, and given the similarities uh, which Smith noted between investments in human capital and in physical capital and technology, I wonder what he might have said not only about human capital formation, but also about the debates we're having in the UK at the moment about skilled immigration. Uh, it's almost impossible to speculate, but I think given his dislike for arbitrary government controls, he might have suggested that he might have to consider how, that, how his attitude to information might go by what it comes. In fact, I'm going to appeal to somebody else uh, here because I think his natural liberal attitude fits the systems of political economy when it made no limited system access to some of his policy debates. I, I think back to Gary Becker's Adam Smith address in 1992, in which he argued. But for the US, it's not just about education uh, and labor force policy, but it's also in terms of driving its place in terms of economic growth and global competitiveness. But he also argued that the US needs more skilled workers to inflation. So actually, it's interesting that we have you know, that those liberal attitudes picked up elsewhere, as Marcus mentioned, in many different people uh, believe in that liberal side of, of, of Smith, and you know, we may want to revisit that in theory. However, Smith was also a great advocate of the importance of social cohesion. I'm going to come back to that in order to cast the course quite widely in the future. Let me, in just my final minute, touch on a second theme. One of the most striking things in the Welsh Commission is, of course, the, this global picture, the geopolitics picture he paints, because it was a lot of it was about Britain's relationship with its rebellious colonies in North America. 
Um, my late colleague in Glasgow, who was an expert in, in the skin and stuff, was doing one of the different articles on Smith. And the Smith's interest was a largely by the American question. That's one, one of the things that he was thinking about in writing it. In fact, they became the side Smith for the delay in publishing the Wild Dimensions by saying he waited for the fate of the Americans to decide what he did at all. Uh, and so in the end, he published it in 1776. I think it's a really good example if you read about the Americans and thinking, but not only in the wealth of nations, but in the relation we know he's having with the British government. That he, he understood the interdependence of political yeah. politics, economics, and international relations with this. Uh, so he was very much a political economist. His analysis of the problem was pretty face, I think, in the late 1770s, tell us that he would have been really alert by the year in 2024 at the interdependence between our international relations and our foreign relations to a few of these debates in Smith. Um, and I think this fundamental understanding, I think, also highlights the sophisticated nature of Smith's thinking. He doesn't just look at issues from a single ideological viewpoint. And, 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 and Ronnie and Dan and Marcus have mentioned this. His whole approach to moral philosophy is based on impartial expectation. And that's one of the themes of the theory of moral sentence. He believed that for us to understand our own moral conduct, one must imagine what our conduct looks like to a disinterested spectator of an external judgment. And I think in 2024, he might have been a very harsh critic, but quite right with respect to it, of some of the behaviors in public life because of his ability to stand back. But more importantly, I think he would have been very concerned by forces, as Kat has said, threatening social and economic cohesion and modern democracy. I've got little doubt that he would have been interested in what the economists discuss around the importance of institutions, which favor the emergence of sustenance of social norms, cohesive social civil society, trust, people's body, democracy, and that of mentioned. I think the, the wealth of nations is full of conditional discussions on a gradualist approach to policy making. I think Smith would have put above all the importance of defending the stability of liberal democracy. So let me stop there again. Hopefully, I guess there's something. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the time. So I'm going to give a couple of questions that really keen to get some questions from the audience. But maybe I could pick up on the broad theme that you were coming to at the end, Anton, about what what a policymaker could learn from Adam Smith today. And I'm struck by Jesse Norman's quote where in his book, in his brilliant book on Smith, where he talks about any policymaker. You can could, you could read Smith any way you want and you'll get any policy idea you want. But it's his way of thinking that is really important. So maybe, could you expand on that first, Anton, and maybe then come to Kat, because you touched on that, and then uh, to, to Marcus and Ronnie. So, thanks, Ben. Let me expand on, on the America's point, because I think that's a really good example. I of what Smith would have been like as a policy advisor, uh, pretty much as uh, uh, an economist who does not think like do these things. But he had a he had a view, we know he had a view that one possible solution to the American the problem of the Americans was actually union. Union between the United Kingdom and the colonies, and ultimately that would have avoided the tension that existed around uh, around the way in which the colonies trading and tax uh, issues had been dealt with. Practically, that was no longer a possibility. So he was then looking at other possibilities. You know how you know there could be trading arrangements in place, even if independence was achieved, which would have created you know opportunities for Britain. So I think exactly that. I don't think he was an ideological thinker in this space. I don't, you know, had he been here during the Brexit debate, I don't think he would have said, "Okay, so, you know, there's a there's a there's a problem here." I think he would have tried to be part of the solution to the problem and try to articulate different ways of trying to solve the issue. I don't think he would have said, uh, this is it, uh, this is my view, and uh, it's uh, and no matter what. So uh, I, I think in that sense, he was somebody who, who, who didn't pin his colours to one particular ideological mast. Mm. And Kat, maybe we can speak to your perspective on this about Smith's way of thinking mm. in approaching problems rather than saying, here's the exact solution that we need to follow. Yeah, I mean, I think Anton's absolutely right. I mean, Smith, you know, existed before we even think about the, the you know, left and right ideologies we think about it today. It just wasn't actually part of his his world and it wasn't part of his, his, his thinking. But uh, we do know, I mean, through Smith's correspondence and letters, obviously the last, um, you know, decade of his life, he was in a, he was in a, 
effectively a policy role right, in terms of customs. And we know from that correspondence, he, he knows the difficulty in enacting regulations. So he, he talks in some of his letters about, you know, I must congratulate you on your, you know, he's congratulating a, a colleague on introducing taxes saying, you know, but you'll never get it right. So well done anyway for trying. And um, so I think he would understand the complexity of doing so. But I think um, what Smith also understood is the really important aspect at, the, at a very basic level in terms of practicing what you preach. Um, so we know when Smith took up the role um, with, with customs, um, he found out that something in his, his um, wardrobe had actually um, illegally um, shouldn't have been in the country. He shouldn't have, he should have paid. He should have paid customs on it. So he burnt it. And um, you know, now this is probably used perhaps a slightly. Um, <clears throat> Uh, perhaps this is part of his character or personality, but I think what it does in a very in a very simple way is actually, you know, if you're going to put regulation in place, you need to be seen to actually following it, and that actually speaks to his ideas of justice and and to ethics as well. And um, so, whilst we can laugh about you know him burning a, a neckerchief, I think it actually speaks very properly to when you're in a public position and when you're in a position of power, in order for people to buy into whatever policy um, or mechanism that you're wanting them to do, you have to be seen to follow follow it as, as well. Yeah, I, I think Kath mentioning the the, uh, the customs duty aspect of Smith is very important because mm. my understanding of that is one of the reasons he was keen to do that was obviously to earn some cash, but also to get closer to the policy, mm. uh, mm -hmm. the policy mm. mindset. Yeah. And the very interesting thing to come out of that, I believe, in the, in the very last edition of The Wealth of Nations, and this goes back to a point we've all made about social cohesion and trust, that if, that if that civic trust is to be inculcated, it must start at the top, it must start with the politicians. And he makes clear that politicians have got to be incorruptible. And if they're not seen as that, then you cannot have civic trust in the rest of society. And I believe that is one of the big failures of, of countries which have followed neoliberal policies that are, are policymakers can't be trusted in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marcus, the popularity of PPE which may I remind you um, was studied by this trust and also Richard Sunak. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is something of which Adam Smith would approve, mm -hmm. putting together the politics and economics. Mm -hmm. And because that's what that's a really important I want to maybe pick that up. So um, you know you you spoke quite often there, Ronnie, about the moral philosophy aspect of Smith and and the like social scientists and politics. We had Angus Deaton over, uh, so Angus Deaton over in June to one of our talks, and he was he was scathing of the economics profession about what it become, and he and his his talk was actually not a failure of economics, a failure of economists, and actually mm -hmm. it's the it's economists, the discipline that has okay, by moving away from the moral philosophy aspect of that. But just it'd be interesting to know, do you agree with that, and what if you do what? What do you need to potentially change within our training of young economists for the next generation coming through to have more of a moral element within that? You can disagree with that, of course. I, I certainly agree with the first part. You won't be surprised to know from my initial statements. And you know, Smith was very clear that you cannot have an economic uh, subject, if we can call it that, based on a single virtue, which has become prudence. Um, and he was very much against utilitarianism as a, a moral philosophy. So he, I think he'd be very much against moral, uh, modern economics. Uh, I have to say that. <laughs> Although I, I don't doubt he is the father of, of uh, modern economics, I think his economics would be very different because the, the virtuous man or woman is one who reflects not only prudence, but benevolence and um, temperance. So uh, you, you have to... Um, you have to recognise that. And yes, to your second question, I think we need a broader uh, discipline. Maybe the discipline bifurcates where the, 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 the very technical side of things continues as it is. And we have a, a, a more Smithian based uh, system based on, on ethics and more. <laughs> I look forward to hearing what. Yeah, that answers what you I suppose I, I don't do technical economics and money business going down. So it's I'm uh, calling the point that is when you then try to take that and bring that into the policy work somewhere or somewhere else within a broader line. As an intellectual exercise, I mean, as Kat was saying, he was somebody who was interested in all sorts of things. He would have probably been fascinated by modern economics. When you then try to make the leap from that to mm. saying what's good for society, that's a policy. Mm. 
uh, and I think colleagues are right in that respect. I think I, but, but perhaps I'm a bit less angry about colleagues than Angus, <laughs> than Angus was. Yeah. Before, but, uh, but I was sort of sympathetic with some of the points he made about mm. where economics should go. Yeah. I, I would agree. I mean, I think would very quickly pick up on that. I think, you know, whether whether you thought how we take it into the world is almost not a Smithian question, but I think what we can learn is what Smith really believed in was a pl plurality of knowledge. Okay, so, you know, and, and we do have this um, challenge where in order to achieve, in order to compete in the market, in that aggressive labour market, you have to go and study econ economics, not just economics, in the right place. You have to come from the right school. You have to have the right social capital in order to do it. So, so in in some ways, you know, in order to be competitive in the market that Smith mm. said was there, we're actually cutting off our Smithian methodology in terms of how we introduce people to a plurality of knowledge and a plurality of ways of thinking. So we have a real conundrum, I think, when we think about kind of, you know, how we how we introduce people into the discipline and how we introduce people into into the sector um, who are actually following a, a, a very sensible rationale by, by studying economics in, in a particular place and yet foregoing a plurality of understanding and education that Smith said was so valuable in terms of how we come to debate and think through ideas and come up with solutions. Okay, so we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, this microphone is for recording purposes, so um, Neil will come around. Thank you, Rob. And Casey, yeah, somebody who actually studied modern greats as well, so I'm aware of this. Um, I thought this was interesting as one who spent some of the lockdown writing about social capital, which I never thought very much about, but then sort of realised how important it might be. I thought that some of the introduction was very useful for us today. I wanted to actually pick up on something which Anton said at the end, although I think you all sort of ended up by agreeing with it, and that was the importance of education um, and uh, the importance of continuing education, the importance of learning, the importance of being able to understand, empathise and whatever. And I come to the interesting point about how Smith regarded capital as not just physical capital, but human capital. And I want to bring that to a more modern thing, which is that under today's national accounting systems, education is not counted as investment in capital. And that has all kinds of implications, whether or not one wants to subscribe to this or not, about what governments should borrow to invest in and what not, because investing in the physical stuff seems to be all right, but investing in the human stuff is not somehow. So I wonder whether we could talk about that at some stage as well. Mm -hmm. Look, very, very happy to respond. Yes, I, I, I do agree that it's a, it's a strange distinction. And, 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 and by extension, you know, others have said, we need to look at other capitals. I think it is slightly bizarre the way we define capital. That's now under attack from various points. So it may not have on the human capital. And what is tangible capital? What isn't tangible capital? What is, you know, what are we doing about uh, maintaining natural capital as colleagues? So I think it's, no, it would be a good way to look at it. To look at it again. And, and even if it ends up, you know, destroying most of our empirical economic studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I just reinforce Anton's point that we, we do have to think about other forms of capital as well. You did pick up in the social capital, which, as I said, the, the key component of that is trust. And that has been severely depleted, trust in government, civic trust, and so on. And so that's all got to be rebuilt. And that, there are policy implications of that, I think. But crucially, natural capital and social capital have been depleted by the, um, the, the issue of the corporation I mentioned, the divorce of ownership and control. And as we've all mentioned, the Freeman dictum has been hugely corrosive in our society. And Freeman did see himself in, in, uh, as a follower of Smith, which I believe is entirely wrong. And so there are, I think, very clear policy implications there as well. Thank you so much for these excellent presentations. I'm Domitiana Turkaldi, Senior Social Researcher here at Easter.
I'm a sociologist by background and migration researcher. So my question for you is the following. You've talked a lot about trust and social cohesion and, and plurality of knowledge. So how do we build, what policies do we need to build trust in societies that are not national or homogeneous, but rather super diverse, where mm -hmm. trust is eroded not just by neoliberal policies, but also by cultural beliefs around gender, uh, race, uh, diversity, and all that. So I would love to hear your thoughts mm -hmm. on that. Thank you. Oh, that's easy. Um, so I think I think that's a great point. I mean, and this is something. So as a as a gender scholar in, in my other life, so I look at women's health, and you know, I would never kind of go into a women's health committee in the Scottish government and start talking about Adam Smith because you know, his his work on gender was um, embryonic, let's say. Um, but um, but 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 what I would argue, I mean, the the way that I the way that I think we do come back to it from from what. Um, picking up on what Anthony was saying about the impartial spectators. So um, the point that, that um, Adam Smith made was, we don't have to know exactly how another person would feel. In fact, it's impossible to do that. And when we do that, all we're really doing is reproducing our own arrogance and our own kind of worldview. What it requires is kind of a, a recognition that the other may feel this particular way. They may choose to react a particular way. They may come from a particular position, but that's an incomplete gap that we have. And his, um, his figure of the impartial spectator is um, encouraging us to think like this in terms of how we view empathy through difference. And um, I think this idea of empathy through difference is really, um, I would say, undermined in, in kind of Smithian, um, Smithian thought. Um, one could argue it's because it's been uh, predominantly men and white men who have looked at Smith um, historically. So perhaps there's, uh, there's, perhaps there's um, some work to be done there in terms of the plurality of knowledge that scholars themselves bring to Smith. But I think it comes, I'd just say, despite this, I think it's really important to recognize that if we're not able to build on a sociality, on a way that we are, or the way that we encounter others, and um, it doesn't encourage difference, um, then we're not going to be able to come up with policies that work for all or policies that even recognize others. And um, so what I would argue is I think it's absolutely in Smith's work, and I think Smith gives us the tools and resources in order to think through how we empathize through difference. Um, but whether that translates into how he's currently written about and whether it actually translates into how we think about Smith in terms of um, building on this simultaneous, uh, simultaneous idea of economics and, and social relations is still work that has to be done. Um, but we have till 2026, which is the Wealth of Nations anniversary to do it. So, so I'd encourage you to start now. So yeah, that's what I would yeah, respond. Okay, thanks, Kat. So um, I'm just conscious of time and that we've used up our allocation for this session. I hope we've managed through this conversation to convince you that Smith is still relevant for 2024 and the big challenges that we face. We're going to take about a 10-minute break now before we move to the next panel. But before we do that, could you please join me in thanking Ronnie, Marcus, Kat, and our friends. <laughs> So good afternoon and uh, welcome to the uh, second panel on trade uh, and the global uh, from a global approach or a global viewpoint. Uh, my name is Sainthan Ghoshal and uh, um, I co-edited with Anton and with Graham the special issue of which hopefully all of you have a copy. Um, I'm, a, the, uh, I'm a professor of economics at Glasgow University, uh, holding currently the Adam Smith chair, which was inherited from Ronnie, who is also sitting here in the audience here. Um, so um, let me introduce the, the speaker. Um, so um, let, let me begin in reverse order, in the, the reverse order of how the, of their speaking. So uh, Dr. Maha Rafi Atal is the Adam Smith lecturer in political economy at the School of Social and Political Sciences. And uh, she takes a, a political economy approach to the study of corporate power. She's working on a book project which examines corporate social responsibility <coughs> as a system of company rule from colonial trading corporations to contemporary multinationals. Um, she was a journalist before joining academia and uh, got, has served as a postdoc in Copenhagen and has degrees from Cambridge, Brown, and Columbia. 
Um, professor David Williams is a professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University. He has a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, he was the um, he was a research fellow at the Lady Margaret Hall and a lecturer at Oxford University and professor and head of department for international politics at City University before joining Queen Mary. Uh, his research interests lie at the intersection of international relations, international development and political theory. And he has just finished a book on anti-colonial liberalism. Um, and our first speaker on the panel is going to be Professor L. Allen Winter, CB. Um, he's a professor of economics at the University of Sussex. He's the principal investigator and co-director of the ESRC funded Center for Inclusive Trade Policy and the founding director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Before that, he was the chief economist at uh, DFIT, such as it was then, um, the director of the development research group at the World Bank. He has served as the chair of the Board of uh, Global Development, is a council member of the ESRC and the CEO of the Migrating Out of Poverty Program. He has advised various governments, including the UK government, the OECE, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the European Commission, the European Parliament, UNCTAD, WTO, and the Inter-American Development Bank. So his research interests, current research interests focus on UK post-Brexit trade policy, but broadly speaking, that sits within uh, his overall research interest of empirical and policy analysis of international trade. Uh, and he has published two, over 250 articles and chapters and 30 books on this topic. So um, may I begin, uh, turn it over to you, Alan. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Santan. Um, so I've got a much narrower focus than uh, the previous panel had. I just want to talk about what Smith um, had to say, really, about international trade policy. Um, Smith was not a great contributor on trade theory per se, although he did make two interesting observations that have real resonance today. One, because of his view of the division of labor, market side matter. Remember, we've talked about market side and trade matters for market side, of course. And also, he did say that uh, countries uh, trade between themselves in proportion to the world population proximity and effective. Okay. Sorry, the mic is. Uh, okay. Okay. You need to switch it off. Sorry, you're hijacked yeah. by the technology yes. <laughs> okay. uh, because there was an echo. Just, just, just. Okay. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll try and speak a little bit. Yeah. Right. As I think uh, as I commented, that uh, trade between countries is in proportion to the wealth, population, proximity of respective countries. Any trade scholar says, ah, oh, that's the gravity model of which we are so proud uh, these days. Uh, so it actually goes a long way back. But much more important than Smith's view on trade theory was his view on trade policy. And at least Douglas Irwin argues that it's the first time there was a coherent theory of trade policy ever articulated. And Smith argued that you've got to assess policy, any policy, but including trade policy, by a national focus, and got very close, actually, to something like gross domestic product. He also said, and I think this should be nailed above the head of every undergraduate and politician in the country, uh, consumption is the sole end of and purpose of all production. You only consider production to the extent that it enhances uh, the interest of the consumer. And the third big insight that he brought in this theory of trade policy was essentially a general equilibrium view. Yeah, no regulation of commerce can increase the quantity of interest in any society beyond what its capital can maintain. It can only divert a part into one direction into which it might not otherwise have gone. In other words, if you want to do more of this, you end up doing less of that. And he was expressed the general view that that was a pretty worrying place for government to be. was not very dogmatic about it, but you really need to be careful about it. He was much more explicit about trade policy. And then he said, look, there is really not much reason for intervention. That if a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we can ourselves make it, better buy it than them with uh, some part of the produce of our own industry. 
point in a way in which we have some advantage. In other words, you really do need to have a good reason for it. Uh, but he was certainly not so everyone I think here would agree, not an essay fair fundamentalist as well as a very pragmatic approach. And he recognized four exceptions such as one of the great war. Uh, and everyone I believe uh, is really very topical uh, today. Uh, we hear it used in great policy discussions today, it underpins part of WTO and so on. The, the, the three or four exceptions that he recognized uh, were first industry, at least to support industries when it's necessary for defense. World Trade Organization, the GATT before it has a national security exception. It's a, nothing in this treaty uh, shall be released. It would come security and threat. Uh, we constantly hear about this sort of security issue with the US China friction, which we are all going to feel. And increasingly, there is mention of national security in what's coming to be called new industrial policy. The interventions the government are undertaking today quite often go back to mention national security, not always very much. The second the reason to intervene was level playing field to levy the same indirect taxes on imports as on domestic production. And that's exactly what we do with value-added tax. You don't pay for exports, you pay for imports coming in, tax on the border. If you're using carbon abroad, you should pay the same price. much more pragmatic, much more sort of tactical. First, in retaliation against overseas trade restrictions, but only if the cost of retaliating is less than the cost of the damage done, and there's a reasonable chance uh, that the offending policy will be rescinded. We've seen retaliation historically in the 18th century, we see it all the time now, but it also is actually the mechanism through which the World Trade Organization enforces its views in all varieties of countries to retaliate one against another. So the first group of the WTO is back into the and it is that it doesn't say retaliate any time when you like. It says the real problem about how you can retaliate in terms of which you can retaliate. But it's there. So that's step again. And then finally talk about you know, not reducing an import tariff where it would cause severe dislocation of domestic labor and capital. And he considered this possible but not likely. He thought economies would adjust in general. Um. But in fact, you see this throughout protection in other countries. Exactly. Actually, trying to prevent disruption from competitive imports. Well, trade organizations are getting authorized in the event that imports are highly disruptive or at least unforeseen surges in imports. In the um, uh, mentions another dimension of Smith's sort of relevance to trade policy now, in a sense, a uh, rather more, I hope, Goes on to outline one particularly egregious bit of misgovernance 
the bar and international trains to the the right step in place that if something goes the train has his authority to let the train something to take the car a calculating duty. So if I say how it's gonna be the set up in a very reasonable way in one month which is that it will then from their rules they press the WCL rules a few months later and change the rules back so, and a few months after that this body is a lot in fact a reasonable constraint. Frankly, I'm getting the text and the link from the Zona has been basically shuttered. And that fits that, you know, double question. That is not the way to do it. So, as someone who's uh, spent, uh, some people would say, wasted his whole life with international trade. Um, Rather than the history of thought, I, I confess I discussed. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. So, uh, you know, uh, you raised a number of points about trade policy, uh, you know, from a perspective which one might broadly call liberal, um, and Adam Smith being the epitome of classical liberalism. Um, uh, David, I wonder uh, whether in your paper, whether you could elucidate on those points in your paper, which were about a liberal critique of colonialism. Mm. David, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I want to continue um, thinking about Smith's thinking about the international arena, but shift the focus a bit to focus on Smith's arguments about European colonialism and European imperialism more generally. And we could talk about what distinction there might be between those two things if, if people want. As has been noted actually in the uh, earlier panel, Smith had a very long standing interest in the, clon in the colonial and imperial affairs of his day. He wrote a memorandum for the British government on its relations with its North American colonies. And if you read the Wealth of Nations as well as the lectures on jurisprudence in particular, you find kind of references to empire, imperialism, and colonialism shot through his work in that sense. You know, Smith is a great sort of enlightenment scholar interested in all, all kinds of things. Now, on the other hand, you know, his arguments about European colonialism are sometimes not 100% clear. That's, I mean, he wrote a lot, probably changed his mind about things. It's not, that's not a criticism of Smith. Um, and sometimes they are a little bit complicated. What I want to do is just focus on what, what we might think of, although we can talk about whether it really is, a kind of tension, if you like, in Smith's arguments about colonialism. And the idea is not so much that we have something very specific to learn from Smith, some specific policy guidance that we might have, but I do think that following Smith, we can perhaps might help us to think a bit better about uh, some of the analogous problems that Europeans and Western states more generally have faced over the last uh, 20, 30 years, and perhaps continue to face. Um, the Wealth of Nations called Of Colonies, which forms a central chunk of his attack on mercantilist uh, trade policy. Smith engaged in a sustained critique of European imperialism. His conclusion, so this is 1776, Great Britain should voluntarily give up all authority over her colonies and leave them to elect their own magistrates, to enact their laws, and to make peace and war as they might think proper. In other words, Britain should just get rid of its colony. Now, it is important to remember here that this quote is particularly concerned with the European colonies in the Americas. Okay, so, you know, the question of India doesn't, I searched and searched and searched, Smith has nothing to say about what was emerging. In, in India. Anyway, so that, but his conclusion there is, is pretty clear. What were the reasons Smith gave? Well, first of all, of course, and famously, the supposed benefits from control over mercantile, over the colonial trade, the sort of mercantilist control of, of colonial trade were an illusion. This was not actually beneficial for Britain to control, or any of the other European powers, to control the colonial trade. Secondly, it was costly to Britain to defend the colonies against imperial rivals. They didn't pay for their military, which would sail to them to save them if the French started to attack them. 
He also said that the imposition of controls on colonial trade were an infringement of what Smith called the natural liberty of the colonists, right, to trade as they saw fit and to do what they thought fit. Now, Smith did talk about some of the costs to those particularly indigenous groups who had found themselves on the thick end of European colonialism, right? And he acknowledged that. He acknowledged their suffering. He acknowledged the cruelty which they had experienced. So he wasn't blind to that. But his key arguments are about the cost to Britain for, from maintaining its colonies. So why then did it continue? Why did Britain continue to have these things which, according to Smith, brought no benefits? Well, Smith says that emancipation of the colonies, he's talking here more generally about Europe, would be, and this is a great quote, mortifying to the pride of every nation. In other words, Smith here is pointing to sort of slightly more darker emotional forces which are, you know, make, which are, keep making European states hold on to their uh, colonies. He talks about human folly, the absurd confidence which almost all men have in their own good fortune that propelled these colonial ventures in the face of the judgment of sober reason and experience. In other words, he just thinks that people will be tempted to engage in these kind of colonial activities, originally, of course, because there was gold or silver, and now because there'll be great riches to be found and so on. <clears throat> and thirdly, and perhaps more importantly, and I know Sarah's going to talk more about this, those who benefited from colonial trade, the great trading houses and the merchants, had become politically powerful and influenced government policy. This is a great quote. I'll just read it quickly. Of the greater part of the regulations concerning the colony trade, the merchants who carry it on, it must be observed, have been the principal advisors. We must not wonder, therefore, if in greater part of them, their interests have been more considered than either that of the colony or that of the mother country. So Smith is very clear here that this, the, the mercantile trade, the influence of mercantile trade policy on government not just detrimental to the colonists themselves, who ought to be able to trade freely, but actually to Britain more generally. Right? This is this idea of a sort of captured government policy. Now, this seems simple enough, and Smith is in some ways rightly thought of as a kind of anti-colonial, what we would now call liberal thinker. But when it came to the overall benefits of European expansion, and especially British imperial expansion, Smith had a slightly different view. I just there's just a few quotes just to illustrate. There's a very famous quote, justly famous, um, in the Wealth of Nations, where Smith says the discovery of the America, uh, discovery of America, and now of the passage to the East Indies by the Cape of Good Hope, are the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind. Okay, this is big. Why is this? Well, they united the most distant parts of the world, and thus enabled them to, and I quote relieve one another's wants, to increase one another's enjoyments, and to encourage one another's industries. In other words, European imperialism, European expansion, was actually a powerful force for economic development that had benefits for mankind at large, even though, of course, some of the people who experienced European colonialism would suffer great cruelties. Even viewed on a smaller scale, taking particular kind of the actual establishment of colonies, Smith was convinced that European colonialism could be beneficial. And another quote, the colony of a civilized nation, oh, note, the, note the language, which takes possession either of a waste country or of one so thinly inhabited that the natives easily give way to the new settlers, mm. advances more rapidly to wealth and greatness than any other society. And he's probably thinking here, of course, of America, not just North America, but also some of the, the, the South American colonies. Why is this? The colonists carry out with them a knowledge of agriculture and other useful arts, superior to what can grow up of its own accord in the course of many centuries amongst savage and barbarous nations. So these quotes suggest that while Smith thought that European uh, colonialism as practice was often extremely costly, certainly cruel, was not really in Britain's interest. He also thought that the overall project of European conquest and colonial rule had in fact helped to produce certain benefits, wealth, <coughs> improvement, cultivation, civilization, that might not have been realized if these places had not been colonized. 
In other words, and in classic Smith way, you have this kind of two thoughts about colonialism going on. I highlight this because I think it's a core tension in his work, but also we might think of it, put rather crudely in this in my last point, a core tension between what we might call the claims of freedom or liberty and claims about progress. These two things, both of which Smith thought were extremely important, are not always easy to reconcile. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so David, you clearly highlighted the point that um, in a sense, there is a scope for a very nuanced and detailed critique of colonialism, more, perhaps starting from Smith, but perhaps modifying elements of his, of his work. In practice, of course, colonialism was carried out by corporations who had monopoly uh, over colonial trade. And, to, and we see the emergence of such corporations as well in today's uh, trade network. So Marcus in the previous panel talked about you know, if the economies of scale and the size of the market coincide, the monopolies may emerge in the context of global supply chains, for example. Um, and your work, uh, Maha, is about sort of understanding the continuities in a sense, starting from that colonial trade to contemporary large corporations. So uh, I come at it from a variety of different theoretical approaches. So I turn it over to you to tell us about your, your work and your research. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually really lovely to follow from, from David's remarks, but it also gives me the opportunity maybe to tweak them just a little. <laughs> um, so advance, advance warning. Um, I think it's important, because uh, I want to pick up on this idea of liberty, in, in talking about Smith and the Corporation, just to say, you know, what I always say to my students, which is, when you're reading works from the 18th century, yes, they wrote in English, but they spoke English differently than we speak it now. And so it's important to understand that when he talks about kind of liberty and commercial liberty in an 18th century sense, um, you know, commerce meant something more than just trade, right? It didn't just mean the exchange of goods and services, but it also meant the exchange of culture and ideas, right? For an 18th century scholar, we're commercing right now. This is commercing. Um, and so when he talks about commercial liberty, he means liberty in a much broader sense than just the liberty to pandemic, right? He means liberty at a human level. Um, and so for Smith, when he's talking about liberty in markets and free markets, he doesn't just mean that the market actors in the sense of merchants should be free, but that all the people participating in those markets need to be kind of freely participating in them. And that's where part of the critique of empire and in particular his critique of slavery comes in. Um, so that while he's talking about free markets, he saw the actually existing markets of his time as unfree and unjust. Um, and at the center of that was the corporation, which was emerging as a kind of new entity in the global economy at the time, and in particular in the form of these large monopolistic corporations, as Sanjan referred to, um, like the East India Company, which were given kind of government charters in order to go out and engage right, in colonial trade and given monopolies either over specific regions where they could trade or over the trade in particular goods and services. Um, and that was the dominant form of corporation that existed at the time, right? Most other forms of business were not carried out by incorporated companies, but were carried out by small partnerships in which the partners, the investors would have, right, full liability, right, at a personal level for anything that the firm did. And Smith made a critique of the corporation, right, as, you know, represented by the East India Company, by the merchant inventors, by other companies at that time, at kind of three levels that I want to kind of talk through. The first, and this is maybe Smith, right? Smith as what we would now think of as an economist, right? We're making this distinction in the first panel, I think, between kind of economics and, and political economy. And he, of course, straddles both, right? But the first critique is that corporations are economically inefficient and given to all sorts of forms of market healthcare. Um, and that's the point I think that Ronnie was making about kind of the distinction between ownership and control. Um, that in organizations where the investors have limited liability, uh, and there are external shareholders in the form of a joint stock corporation who are expecting profits, um, that there's an accountability problem because the managers are not fully accountable for their conduct. Um, and there's a productivity problem because the desire to deliver profits to shareholders disincentivizes right reinvestment of capital in productive activities. Um, and so for Smith, right, productive investment is investment in labor, investment in human capital, investment in infrastructure, um, and that the distinction between ownership and control is actually corrupting um, of those activities. 
Um, and so for him, right, uh, most business activities should be conducted through small partnerships. Um, and then he carves out a very small area, right, of activities that he says, you require those economies of scale, um, that where a corporation should be in effect, things like banking, things like public infrastructure, and certain forms of international colonial trade. But because he's identifying basically public utilities as the place where that should be happening, right, the argument is that they should be regulated like public utilities. They should be fundamentally, <clears throat> essentially public actors. Um, the second right thing that follows from that is this distinction between productive and unproductive capital means that he places a very high premium on what we would now think of as the social reproduction of the labor force. So he says, right, no society, right, can be flourishing or happy where the workers do not earn enough, not only to live well, but to be able to support their families and produce the next generation of workers. Um, so that in a growing economy, right, uh, wages should be rising. Um, and wages need to remain high enough to support that social reproduction. So he's trying to incentivize a system of governing business in which businesses are incentivized to make that reinvestment. And he's concerned, right, that the corporate form does not seem to tend um, in that direction. Um, and because of that, he has some really interesting things to say uh, about labor and that he is concerned about the ways in which, uh, you know, sort of corporate owners are incentivized and factory owners are incentivized, right, um, to sort of hmm. prevent their workers from organizing to raise wages. Um, and he acknowledges that the mechanisms that workers might take, and this is, you know, the early period of industrialization, he's writing in Glasgow, there are beginning to be kind of efforts at union organizing, but it's quite disruptive and can be quite violent. Um, and he acknowledges that those strikes can often be violent. And he says, look, these workers are desperate. This is the option that they have. Um, but he also acknowledges that these corporations, in part because corporations are these political creations, have the ability to call the state in on their side, right? Managers are able to defeat workers' efforts to raise wages because, and I'm going to quote here, they never cease to call aloud for the assistance of the civil magistrate and the rigorous execution of those laws which have been enacted with so much severity against the combination of servants, laborers, and journey. So he's very concerned about that form of chronic. Um, and then the third thing, and this is the point that, um, that David was making, is that when international policy is being set by these corporations, they bend the international policy of the state in the interests of merchants, which may not be the interests, right, of the nation. Um, and so uh, that's the argument that he's making, right, about the East India Company, where he says, you know, their status as traders, right, has made them very bad sovereigns, but their status as sovereigns has made them very bad traders. This is a fundamental <laughs> tension right, between what's in the interest of the company's profits and what's in the interest of the people they rule over. Um, and this is where I'll tweet you slightly and that he says almost nothing about British government policy in India, but he does say something about the East India Company's governance of India and in that they presided over a massive famine in Bengal at the time when he's writing The Wealth of Nations. And he says, look, this is the evidence that there's some fundamental tension in what it was that they were meant to do as government of this particular country to not have people starve there and their interests, right, um, the sovereign. Um, and what he's writing, what's happening in the American colonies right at that time, is that the British government is trying to patch a hole in the company's balance sheet by changing the tax policy vis-a-vis -vis the American colonies. And that is going to rebound right on the government in a way that's going to break the British Empire in half. And he doesn't know the full story, but he knows enough to know that the tail is wagging the dog. And that's the warning that he's making. So from a contemporary perspective, I think there are a couple of things that come out, right? The first uh, is an argument to be very aggressive in the breakup of monopolistic corporations, not only because they're economically inefficient, but because they tend towards regulatory capture and the corruption of state power. The second is to think <laughs> really strongly about the liberal case for investment in labor and for the ability for labor to negotiate for itself. Um, that there's actually a kind of liberal argument for trade unionism there that's implicit that I think you can pull out. Um, and then... Uh, you know, and then I think uh, the the third piece um, is maybe to think about uh, the distinction between public and private. And this maybe is the really core kind of classical liberal piece of Smith, um, that there's an argument for certain things belong to the market should be done by private firms with private skin in the game, where they, there should never be the moral hazard that the government has to come in and bail you out. And other activities that essentially serve a public good need to come under the umbrella of the state in some way. Um, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, and certainly at our moment in time, there's a lot of public private, you know, sort of partnerships and private services coming into public services where I think Smith has something quite critical. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So, if you have any questions, maybe yes, there is a question from the audience already. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheila Page. I wanted to take up Alan on something David said, which is that Smith identified the role of the merchants in effectively perverting government government's commercial policy, which sounds very much like what Alan is talking about the PRA. Did Smith or could Smith have any remedy for this? I mean, given that the UK Constitution makes it very difficult to uh, embody in legislation uh, controls on this. I mean, it, the US has its uh, has its board, the uh, DG Trade has its legal responsibilities. But how could you stop the merchants from perverting commerce, uh, whether directly, as in David's example, or through the TRA, as in Alan's example? Yes. And to step back a bit, I mean, the great trilogy of works is missing one, right? Which was Smith's reflections on politics and government. I've I've got very far with that. Um, so there's been endless speculation about what it was that Smith would have said about these kinds of questions. Because he can see in a bit of a knot here. So the only solution which was breaking up the uh, the companies or changing trade policy seemed to be cut in down by his own diagnosis of the problem. Right? So how do you have in the kind of And also I think by a more general, you know, you could be There were commercial interests that were connected to the rich, but in love, commercially, they liked the um, uh, stability and certainty about the uh, game they are playing. Um, I think it was actually a rather poor thing with the government that didn't like hearing anything that it didn't like to hear. Um, but I think uh, you know, what one essentially needs to do is you know, the, uh, the car of disinterested individuals, not necessarily politicians. do it, right? I mean, the prescription is really clear about breaking up monopolies. But of course, the problem is that once you have regulatory capture, right, uh, then the mechanisms that you would need to execute, right, in order to break them up uh, are, you know, are effectively prevented uh, by the fact that they have this capture, right, um, on the state. And I, um, you know, um, I know <laughs> Diane Coyle was mentioned in the first panel is very optimistic about the fact that we will actually be able to get uh, you know, some kind of regulatory control over the large fidelity corporations, but actually, 
um, you know, I mean, they are the political monopolies of our time, and they make efforts uh, to separate them up, but even to regulate at a minimal level uh, their conduct in the public interest, I mean, very aggressively, um, and actually have now war chests to fund those legal battles that are much larger than those of the country. So I think the skepticism is in part because the problem he's diagnosing, right, becomes self perpetuating, and it's very, very difficult, short of. You know, essentially, and this is why these senior company case is so interesting. Those monopolies only ever open up when there's like war and lots of people die, right? I mean, these senior companies nationalized because there's a mutiny and the British army has to be called in uh, because they cannot figure out what to do about a mutiny in their own private armed forces, right? I mean, this, this doesn't seem to happen in ways that are like peaceful and through democratic processes. And that's concerning from a liberal perspective. I have a question for Mark. Yeah, very interesting. Thing. I mean, I, I, I find some of this very interesting, and I come back to this sort of disinterested observer who avails of ignorance. Um, I wonder, we haven't actually sort of used the word democracy at all, but actually, who's sort of supposed to be doing this job, and where the democratic virtues come in or democratic possibilities come in. Does he say anything about it? Does he say anything also about the thing which I was always terribly keen on, which was um, sort of platonic republics, which I was always very fond of as long as it was me and my mates who were there sitting on the government. Yeah. Really. So what does, what does, I want to know. Mm. Yeah. You know what you so I was actually going to say as a follow-up to this question. So I mean, the, the short answer is he doesn't say very much about democracy, if anything at all. Um, and that's partly because this great, the kind of discussion of politics just simply is not the book, you know, the thing is not there. Um, it's also part two of the time, although 1776, the American Revolution, there obviously clearly something is happening. And there are alternative understandings about how you can found governments and about the role of democratic or quasi-democratic decision-making and influencing government policy, right? Because I was going to say, and this is one other possibility, is that the other way you do it is you mobilize public opinion and you get them to say, we are not paying more for our sugar and our tea than we ought to, right? So, you know, there is a way there, maybe. This is the virtue of having modern arrangements. Yes, I mean, he was... Not immune from a body of British political theory, which had been developed in the previous sort yeah, of sure. hundred years. So, mm. I mean, he did know about David King, he did know about John Locke, he did mm. know about Thomas. So, he must have had something potentially something to say, wasn't he? To, even if he wasn't writing about it there, was he writing about it somewhere else? Well, I he had most of his papers burned yeah. when he died. Um, so, it, it's a bit hard to know. I think it's a chance. To go back to your platonic thing, I mean, this is also interesting. I mean, he's got this very famous quote about what he calls the man of system. He's very sceptical. So if there is something there that connects up with this longer history of political thinking, he's actually very sceptical about what he calls the man of system, who just thinks you can arrange society and it's all going to be, and people just do what, you know, do what the legislator wants, right? He just thinks that's, that's not a non-starter. So the alternative must be some other form of, of kind of politics, but he, there is, it's not clear what it is. Um, do you have <laughs> um, not really. I mean, I think that... The point is that the uh, democratic institution essentially comes to recognise the need for a little bit of a cutout between the lobby group, the press efforts, and themselves. And what in my sad story about the TRE is actually you know, that, that's, that's a you know, rather bold sort of being that you know, this set of politics, if they're still around in a few years, will we'll regret that, let alone uh, the rest of us. Uh, let me just make a comment about that David's comment about you know, you mobilize public opinion. Uh, one of the things I've been doing very recently is uh, talking to the public about trade policy through a series of citizens' juries. And one of the issues we posed to them was how about a trade agreement uh, like the UK Australia trade agreement that trades off um, uh, benefits for uh, the business services sector against losses 
for agriculture. How do you feel about that? Now, you know, agriculture is the classic case of regulatory capture. The public always, exaggerate, the public <laughs> almost always back agriculture. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to run it. How do you reform agricultural policy? Where when... even these people who have got in Britain, yeah, where we've had free trade, <clears throat> relatively free trade and food for nearly 200 years, it's not like France, where they, everyone's got a grandfather who worked in agriculture. You know, I mean, it, it's just, it's palpable how strong that public view is. It might mm -hmm. be misinformed, but that's what we found. So don't bet too much. No, no, I, I, I wouldn't actually, but I'm just saying that would that is one avenue. So you would... Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, David's right that there's a lot that we don't know because a there are things he didn't get right, and what he was working on, right, by his own instruction, right, everything unfinished was burned. Um, but uh, I think there's kind of two pieces, right, and I think it matters to think about what democracy meant at the time that he's writing. So national government is representative, but it's representative of a very small, right, uh, you know, electorate. Um, and so it, and it's not meaningfully democratic at that level. And most of what he writes about national government is really about the more administrative and technical aspects of the state. So in the letters on jurisprudence, he writes about, you know, the military, he writes about taxation power, he obviously worked in the customs authority, and it's much more technocratic about what those agencies will do than it is about how decision making will be fed into them. But separately, right, he does write quite a bit about kind of local government and civic life. So he writes about kind of education, right, we've talked about that. Um, he writes about, uh, you know, sort of um, like local infrastructure roads and things like that in, in a Scottish context. And in the place where he is living, right, local decision making like that is not done necessarily through democratic government. Uh, it's done through an administrative local state that's tied up with the Scottish church. Um, and he's very, very critical uh, of the institution of the church, the way that local churches are governed, the way that that apparatus is captured by a local aristocracy. It's for him one of the last pieces of feudal society that is persisting. Um, so I think there's like a skepticism also about like where does he actually see democratic participation and the like surround I mean he doesn't write a lot about it because I'm not sure there's much of it in the world in which he's living. Okay. Oh, one final question. I have a question about the model of increasing returns. I have a question about the model of increasing returns to scale and expansion of the market, which is associated with Adam Smith how it may apply to technology leaders like Britain in the 17th and 18th century or America in the last century, but not the colonies. They were at the other end where they had to buy this stuff from the monopoly corporations and not produce uh, the stuff themselves. So is there a sense in which um, Adam Smith was playing to, to one gallery and not to the world as a whole? <laughs> I'm the only avowed non-economist on right. the panel. Oh, I mean, that's, that's not my thing. We have degrees in three subjects, but none of them is equal. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, then we hand it to Alan. But, uh, but, 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 I do, but it's a question. But it is a question about about firms. There's a little bit of this in the discussion of the famine in um, in Bengal and the way in which the company's incentives as a government over this population are intention right, with its incentives as a kind of trading corporation that is ostensibly supposed to be making its money, you know, from, from spices and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and there is, right, an argument there that what would be in the interest of the people in India is not what would be in the interest of the companies. And it does talk about that, right? Um, but the audience is certainly the British public. Um, and, uh, and his concern is really that this will be bad for Britain, right? I mean, it's kind of out of, right, the, the, you know, the purview um, of his of his thought, right? What it would actually mean in the world. But I think your question is really about the tension that um, that David was raising in that there he does know that there's um, that there are fundamental returns to kind of scale that have like arisen from European imperial trade that and he acknowledges that they wouldn't have happened otherwise. And that's in some kind of implicit moral tension, right? With the critique that he's making about how it's actually uh, been carried out. So I don't know that that tension is resolved in the work. I think it's just a version of the of the tension that exists in his wider kind of critique of the part. Can I get a one, 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 one. 
I, I, I know it's all the quick with the three all the things you can do to do things. I still go to not deal with that anymore because I've already done that in that way anyway. I don't deal with that and then you know, have to do it and I think I'm back on the conversation. But it's a twist for a lot of you. I think that's enough. Why do we turn? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's with a lot of you for the limiting. Local economies in that sort of uh, draconian. Mm. David, any? No. Okay, well, I think this draws this panel to a close. So uh, another round of applause for the. Uh, yeah. And uh, I have now the very pleasant task of inviting everyone to